So it's Thursday, July 18th, Senate Government Operations Committee, continuing our conversation about law enforcement and law enforcement reforms. And we've had this conversation quite a bit, quite a few times over the last couple of weeks. And last night, we, yesterday we had a good conversation with um, the folks that were with us. And we ended up with a list that Jeanette put together, the committee chair put together of 16 ideas um, of possibilities, possible things that could be in a bill or reform bill. I mean, I don't think we should imagine that we're gonna be able to put 16 things into a reform bill in a very limited time. But what I wanna do is start talking about narrowing the, down to what we think might be priorities. Um, so imagine if there were like three or four or five things that you were gonna propose we do first, what would they be? Allison, did you have any Yeah, I, just, I hope you got the document that also has the additional uh, items I added last night. Because I, I believe did. the document that, that Gail put up, uh, it, it has more than 16. <laughs> right. That, because it, it does have the uniform data collection stuff that, that you know. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure people had that. So who would like this, who would like to address the question? I mean, we've got a handful of people here. We got James Pepper, Robert Appel, Julio's here, Mark Anderson, Sheriff Mark Anderson. And we haven't heard from Robert, so it would may, might be interesting to hear what Robert thinks of the issues we've identified already. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. I think that he's at a little bit of a detriment in the sense that he just saw the list about 30 seconds ago, but he's oh, been okay. thinking about these issues for a long time. The, the issues are quite familiar to me. All right, so why don't you talk to us for a bit, Robert? Well, eight and nine are very attractive to me. Eight being central point for reporting allegations. Of First, tell everybody who you are. Oh, okay. I'm Robert Appel. <laughs> uh, I'm a retired state employee engaged in a solo um, law practice outside of Burlington, Vermont. I was formerly um, both the executive director and legal counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission for 10 years. Prior to that, I was defender general for eight plus years. Part of that, I was uh, the attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the Attorney General's Office. Uh, and I can go back, but that's plenty. So um, as I said, these issues are very familiar to me. Uh, my practice is primarily um, civil rights enforcement and criminal defense. So, And I've worked with um, several people on the call, Commissioner Shirley, when he was chief here, and Julio and I have worked together over the years. And, I don't know uh, James Pepper, but I know who he is. So, and I don't know the sheriff, uh, but otherwise I, I think, I, and John and I have talked frequently, but I'm not sure we ever met. So uh, with that said, the central point for reporting allegations of officer, officer misconduct, and, and this has been a long standing concern of persons who feel that they were mistreated by police, particularly uh, fatalities, officer involved shootings with, um, and with dead citizens, it's been a long standing theme that the attorney general is not well empowered to adequately address those um, investigations because of it. The AG wears several hats, as we all know. The position is the chief law enforcement officer of the state. So in many ways, institutionally beholden to law enforcement. Uh, also has to work with police officers day in and day out in making criminal cases. At the same time, it also has a civil rights division and, and um, those two duties don't always align. Um, as we're seeing around the country, the investigation of officer involved shootings, when it's done by a chief medical examiner, you get one result. When you take it to a private consultant, you get another result. And I was involved with the taser death in Thetford, Senator Clarkson remembers McAdam Mason. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, the Axon, which used to be Taser International, lobbied the chief medical examiner in New, in, in New Hampshire to add uh, causation that I th thought was wholly inappropriate. So I think it would be, and I've said this over and over again over the years, I think it may be time for Vermont to bite the bullet and create an Office of Inspector General that is truly independent. Behold, no one follows the facts where they go, 
and has the authority to either bring charges, criminal charges, or compel a law enforcement authority, being the AG or the state's attorney in the county where the event occurred, to bring charges. Unless until we get there, I think citizen distrust of internal controls over law enforcement will continue to be lacking. So that one's a big one for me. Uh, possibility of, of body cams for all. Uh, and Commissioner Shirley and I had a quick exchange on this last week or earlier this week. I do a fair number of criminal cases and all of a sudden where it comes to the key component of a, of a consent to search on a motor vehicle stop uh, and there's a there's a um, state police, as you know, have cruiser cameras, but they don't capture what happens at the roadside with the, the detained car. At key moments, all of a sudden, the audio goes blank. Now, um, and sometimes the video goes blank. If it's not the result of a bona fide technical deficiency, to me, if I were the law enforcement executive, I wouldn't want that officer working for me because something's going on when that goes off. And again, I think you need external controls to make that a meaningful uh, accountability standard. 11 is also attractive to me because, you know, you, the legislature in the past 20 years has passed lots of provisions regarding data collection. Uh, I'm not sure that it's compelled to analyze that data at this point by any particular agency. I know that um, my friend and colleague Stephanie Seguino and her partner out at Cornell does that. Uh, but, and the other agency that does that is the CRG, the Crime Research Group. But again, they're funded by the state and beholden to powers. Um, the fact that a department collects data, unless it's analyzed and used, why bother collecting it? And in my recollection, there's no requirement law enforcement executives analyze the data and put it to its proper use, which is to discern whether there are significant disparities based on race or other immutable characteristics by a particular officer, and then go back, review the particular cases and discern whether there is a pattern of discrimination. So I think there's some more work to be done there. Um, having gone through this list very quickly, uh, those are the ones that pop out to me, 16, I would also commend, we don't need a militarized uh, civilian police force. We just don't. Um, I think it really drives a wedge between law enforcement and, and, and the people that they serve under the Vermont constitution. All public officers are accountable to the citizens. And that's just, and, and you look nationwide, I mean, Ferguson and Michael Brown, that was sort of, uh, the first awful use of, of militar, militarization. I could go back to Kent State in May of 70. And you see, saw it with President Trump on, on June 1st, um, using the National Guard and whomever else, we don't know who they were, Bureau of Prison folks, to clear peaceful protesters in a public spot in front of the White House and treating American citizens like they're the enemy. We don't want that. That's not Vermont. I know that uh, state police, last I knew, had one armored personnel carrier. I don't know when it gets deployed. I don't know criteria for when it would be deployed. We do have a National Guard that's well-funded and well-trained and answerable to the governor, who's answerable to the people. I think that's plenty. I know we're short on time. I've not had a- No, Robert, actually, Robert, I wanted to ask the question. Um, we're, we're we're always short on time, but I know that when you talk about uh, a central point for reporting allegations of misconduct, and then you said we need an office of inspector general, which of course would be ideal. But let's presume we don't get an office of inspector general. It, is there a place today where those that reporting should take place? Not Obviously, it takes present, right? not under present resources. Um, having been director of the Human Rights Commission for a decade plus. The independent structure of the agency is attractive. Whether the expertise and the resources exist there, you all are familiar with how uh, commissioners are appointed and confirmed by the Senate. Um, they they serve five-year terms, and there's no there's a mix of political parties. 
And I think that's a fairly independent structure. I mean, if you're gonna go with something that is presently existent in state government, that's where I would lean. But it's gonna take additional resources and additional competency within that office. When you talk about data collection, when we, we had a conversation a couple of times we've talked about that. And not only is the not using the data a problem, but the way data is reporting is very not universal. I mean, different people right. are coding things differently, right. making it that much more difficult to make the make use of the, of the information. Right. It's not in an accessible format. It's uh, often posted in PDF, which drives analysts crazy. Um, the other the other component I don't see on this list, which has been talked about forever in, in the building you all used to occupy, is data sets that talk to each other. You know, between it's states attorneys, sorry, public what? defenders, corrections, and the courts, there's just no consistency of approach. Even within law enforcement, I know Commissioner Sherling was involved in developing one of two software programs, but um, compatibility is key if we're going to have usable data. And I'm not seeing... Um, progress in that area. I think it's a, a key, a, a, a key missing ingredient in trying to get a better overall picture as to the various players who are engaged right. in the criminal justice process to have the same data be able to analyze it in order to slice and dice the way they want. It's not my field, but it's a constant problem. What about citizen review panels? We've talked about that being able to. Yeah. Well, again, um, again um, something I believe strongly in. Um, in some ways, the commission, Human Rights Commission, can f um, function in that capacity. Uh, when I was there, we took complaints against various police agencies uh, and adjudicated them through the administrative process. Um, and that, you know, there is some degree of citizen. Involved. I mean, ultimately, the citizen involvement is 12 to 14 people in a jury box when we used to do that. But that, that's a very cumbersome process. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in citizen involvement. I did make a reference to the Vermont Constitution that says eternal police are to be uh, beholden to the people. And if we don't have meaningful external review, control, and accountability, we're not living up to the constitutional requirements. Um, so, so, so Clarkson, I didn't get to yours, but um, no, no, they they were just it goes to the uniform nature of 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 a, a number of things. Uh, Michael Sherling has has encouraged us to to move in uniform policies. I mean, what some of the policies that that, that we have are, are just not uniform. So they're uniform with the Vermont State Police, but they're not uniform with police departments. So let's right. take something like traffic stops. That you know, right. um, Curtis was talking about how inconsistent traffic stops are around the state. And uh, there is a best practice and there's a, a great model and yet not everybody uses it. So really well, create uniform policies around a number of things. But just to finish on your compatibility of data, critically important, and then uniform collection and an analysis modes that everybody buys into. Those are, you know, I think, there's an overlay of sort of compatibility and uniformity of practice that all the way through this that is well, important and is missing. It's actually pretty interesting and sort of amazing that we're still in that state of affairs where there's no universal data gathering. It's it's really like kind of a, something that's no brainer, isn't it? I mean, come on. One would hope, but we have 75 law enforcement agencies. We have 14 state yeah. attorney's offices. We have an AG's office. We have, uh, you know, courts that don't collect race data. Right. You know, I mean, this is 25, 30 years of conversation that many of you have suffered with us through. So, I mean, yeah. if we're serious about addressing these problems, those are steps that have to be taken, in my humble opinion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to speak in, as and, informally and, as you have and I am. So, appreciate it. Robert, before you depart, um, any thoughts? I'm going on... to hang on, but I'll shut up. Oh, well, you don't need to. You're a great resource for us. Um, the one of the issues, you know, again, that in some ways goes to uniformity is 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 how we train our our police officers. 
did you have any thoughts about about training and well i have plenty of thoughts one thing i'd say about training and i think we've done better in recent decades is in the old days you go to the academy and you're trained how you're supposed to do it and then you go in the street and you're trained by people who've done it the way they've done it for forever so and again unless the chief whoever's the ultimate authority in holding officers to account um, in order to maintain an appropriate uh, and uniform practice you need to hold people accountable when they violate policy and the policies have to be clear uh, the training has to be clear but the key component to avoid problems is when people don't comply to hold them to account I understand this has been a big debate nationally. The difficulty in the unionized setting, and many of our departments are unionized. The Chief Sherling, when he was in Burlington, certainly contends with that. Uh, contracts are difficult to renegotiate. I think that's why folks in Minneapolis want to disband so they can start from scratch on a collective bargaining agreement. So you don't have to go through 18 steps of progressive discipline to get rid of an officer who should not be an officer. So that's some quick thoughts, Senator Clarkson. Thank you. Who would like to speak next? Anybody interested? Julio or Mark? James? Mark? Uh, Senator, I'd be happy to talk, but I'm happy to wait for others as well, given that I've spoken before this committee. Uh, very much. Well, everybody who's with us today has been with us before, as far as I can tell. Um, so you don't have to wait. In other words, it's everybody's it's equal opportunity time. Uh, very good. So referencing the, uh, the list uh, from Senator White, um, one thing I would like to offer, this is actually something we were beginning to work on in my county, just based on hearing some of the witness testimony and saying, hey, we can do that, um, is uh, essentially a civilian review uh, board. Uh, I'm calling it my, the Sheriff's Advisory Council, uh, which is something that I was working to do with our uh, community. Develop, uh, develop a to get input on my department's policies and procedures. Most municipal police departments have a select board who uh, can be that collective elected voice uh, of the people. As a sheriff, I'm in it. Uh, and that's not a very fun position to be in when you're trying to talk about things you don't necessarily know. So uh, we work developing that. Uh, while we do have a uh, review panel as required under our internal investigations uh, policies, uh, we're looking to actually roll these together. And the combination of the conversation about, uh, well, I think it was Senator Bray, uh, going into uh, someone's house to make a complaint about them uh, is difficult. So I actually engaged my, uh, my assistant judges to ask them if they would be part of this so that if there were an issue with my agency specifically, I have no, uh, uh, no uh, authority over my assistant judges. They would be able to be uh, an impartial uh, thing. And I also think it adds to the mission of what do assistant judges do in Vermont? Uh, I think that the, an important mission when we talk about regional things uh, and where, do, where does the sheriff and where do the assistant judges fit in so we began uh, building that uh, already and I'd like to offer uh, that uh, my agency uh, develop. can you hear me yeah for a second but now unfortunately I someone hasn't muted themselves and I can hear conversation going in the background um, we'll try again good mark is stuck Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop my video as well, because I'm not sure if that's hot, uh, being a problem. But uh, okay. did you hear me offering my agency? Uh, as a, yes. As, uh, yes, we, as a yes, we we heard that. Uh, okay, so I would like to, to offer that uh, and see if we could develop a best practice that could be applied across the state. I think it's well received that uh, we need to offer things that aren't uh, law enforcement agencies, and I think an elected official such as an assistant judge who is also represented within the judiciary uh, bears a, a very interesting and unique perspective to be able to provide some of that impartiality. I would love to hear from others, uh, uh, some of the other witnesses, but obviously this is kind of short notice. Uh, 
I'm not going to speak to all the points, um, but uh, the one thing I would like to uh, to reinforce is the uh, the value of the racial equity coordinator on the training council. Uh, I'm uh, as a council member, I am wholly in favor of that. Uh, Commissioner Sherling and I are also uh, chairing the executive director hiring committee, uh, of which uh, the current uh, director is uh, one of the key uh, members of that. Uh, and she has provided some uh, valuable insight already uh, for that. Uh, and I just think it's, it's uh, time to do that. Another piece uh, uh, that I want to uh, speak to is the uniform policies for agencies. Uh, this has been an area I think Senator White and I agree that it becomes problematic as, uh, as these are mandated, but also for many reasons you've spoken to, uh, reasons for having a desirable uh, model policy. Uh, two things about policy. One is, is that training uh, is developed by policy, but then training also drives the creation and change of policy. Uh, and in Vermont, we've had a very unique ability to have standardized training uh, especially in the areas of use of force, but in their other areas, because we all use the same academy. Uh, so if, uh, if it is the committee's position to establish uniform policies and try and standardize across the state, I, my request would be that we uh, establish policies that are at a low enough level to make the, the necessary components standardized, while understanding that Essex County and Wyndham County operate entirely differently than Chittenden County because I don't have, I, I have four deputies who patrol 798 square miles or thereabouts. I don't have uh, 95 or 105 officers such as Broken PD. Uh, so we necessarily have to adjust because of the rural nature of some of the areas that we are, are patrolling. Uh, I will hold the remainder of my comments for others. Uh, and if there's time, I'd be happy to jump in on more. Can I go, Anthony? Just nod. I can see your head. No, yes. Sorry about that. Thank you. So, Mark, I just had a question, and I, I fully understand what you're saying about the diversity in terms of, uh, you know, where people are in the state, more rural areas versus uh, the urban areas in Chittenden County and how you sort of have to operate differently. But aren't there at least some aspects of policy that could be offered statewide i mean we're talking about how people get treated and how professional people are not necessarily how many miles they patrol or how long they are in their uh, patrol vehicles you know what i'm saying i i can appreciate that and i understand that every um sheriff's department and every local agency and the state police have to have certain differences because of uh, the different things that they're doing but I think what we're looking for is some commonality of the way that people get treated. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, I, I think I do understand what you're saying, Senator, and uh, I appreciate uh, your your perspective there. The uh, So going back to training and policy being kind of a chicken and an egg, uh, the, the Vermont Police Academy does standardize how we do traffic stops, uh, the level three academy, uh, in, in the level three academy, I wanna be clear that there's a difference with the level two academy. Uh, the level three academy, uh, not only is there the uh, education where they are taught in patrol procedures, this is how we stop cars, this is why we tell people the purpose for their stop, not ask them the question, but tell them uh, the reason. Uh, the, the reason we approach the cars in certain ways are all based on science, it's based on um, their uh, fatalities and motor vehicle crashes are happening when a police officer has stopped a car. Uh, the the uh, actions about the danger of stops, so that is standardized. Uh, and when I heard uh, Curtis mention about being asked uh, if he knew why he was stopped, um, we, at my agency specifically, has been tr uh, training that we tell everyone for probably about at least a decade. Uh, and the purpose for that, I'll tell you our reasoning, uh, Timothy McVeigh was stopped for having no license plate. He didn't have a real license plate. The, uh, the officer who stopped Timothy McVeigh, if he walked up and said, do you know why I stopped you right after he uh, uh, blew up the, the federal building? Well, I think he would have a different reason for being stopped. And that could be uh, 
uh, fatal for the officer. So it's actually an officer safety issue uh, from the academy's perspective. It's an officer safety issue from our perspective. But to the end uh, that you're speaking, the differences uh, with the agencies also uh, result in how certain things are conducted. Uh, for example, my agency doesn't uh, issue tasers, and not for the reason that you might think. We don't issue tasers because uh, our feeling was that uh, tasers uh, were a tool that while um, it possible that they could be uh, lawfully used uh, to de-escalate an, uh, an incident, we found that our deputies rarely ever reached that level because they used a lot of verbal de-escalation techniques and ultimately we gained compliance even if it took 45 minutes. Now, why is 45 minutes a time important to us? It's about the average amount of time my backup might be coming. And so knowing that I have backup two minutes down the road versus I have backup 45 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, I'm going to uh, be looking at time as a resource in responding to the... Uh, uh, so, um, again, I would ask that if uh, a legislative policy were established that they'd be low level and broad enough to get the consistency you're looking for, but broad enough that allows the agencies to deal with the, the intricacies and the uniqueness of our areas, uh, similar to we do with mental health issues. Is there any way you could talk about what, what you mean by low level? I mean, I know what you mean by low level, but is there an example or something that you could provide us? Uh, may I think about it for a moment and then try to give you a good example instead of making something up on the spot? Sure. Sure. Can I follow up with just another question, uh, Senator sure. Plain, if you could? So, right. Mark, is there a standardized way to conduct a traffic stop statewide right now? Do you know? Uh, I can speak to the extent of what's trained with the academy, uh, which is that uh, you stop a car uh, for whatever reason. We uh, approach the vehicle. There's a, a preferred approach, which is what we call a passenger side approach. Um, so we approach the vehicle, you uh, identify yourself, you identify your agency, and you uh, advise the operator the purpose for the stop. Uh, it's not, again, it's not a question, but it's uh, a statement. Uh, there might be follow-up uh, questions, and those are where we can uh, talk about more advanced trainings that uh, officers across the state receive, including criminal and drug interdiction, uh, but uh, questions uh, or as well as DUI detection. Um, but we'll ask to, for identifying documents such as a driver's license, the registration, and the insurance. The officers are encouraged to return to their vehicles, though in some, uh, some cases, uh, for example, federal PD, a lot of their officers will just step to the rear of the, uh, the offender's vehicle, and they'll use a portable radio. My portable radio doesn't work. I have to go get into my car because it's a higher power radio. Uh, so we return back to the car. We process the documents, generate either a ticket or a warning or any other appropriate action from that point. We return to them, we issue the documents, uh, return uh, their personal information and personally identifying and send them on their way. Um, I think that that's a generalized version of it, but uh, car stops are also a place where uh, there can be a single reason for getting into it and 10 different avenues coming out of it. And you'll have to excuse me, but it's not something that I look forward to. <laughs> I don't think most citizens look forward to getting pulled over because you probably did something wrong or you might have done something wrong. But um, what I seem to sense from Curtis when he was testifying a couple days ago was that the state police seemed, if, if I understood him correctly, to have a little bit different approach than a local agency might have. I'm not saying that's true or false, but that's what I took him to be saying. So it's it's heartening for me to say, or to hear that you say that there is sort of a standard thing. To me, the first thing you should say is, hi, my name is, and, and go from there rather than, do you know why I stopped you? Or can I see your license, please, or something. It seems like if it was standardized, um, it would be better, but maybe it isn't, and I don't know that. Well, so... Uh, to, to follow up on that, uh, this is where I will say that the level two uh, training, uh, not knowing the level two curriculum, uh, because it's only a two week class followed by hands on training, uh, some of the learning of an officer is going to be in the field. Um, and so uh, the one of the things that is discussed, especially in the level two training, but also in the level three training, uh, in the very beginning of the classes, 
uh, the, the students are asked, how much law enforcement experience do you have? And <laughs> nobody raises their hand or people who are previously certified, uh, the link of hand, but explain the limited nature. And then uh, the instructor followed up with, how many people have seen the TV show Cops or Live PD? And the problem is, is that there's been so much uh, visual reinforcement through just watching TV to everybody, including watching CSI, that might not adequately show true police standard, but we are being educated on that. So there's now a need to retrain um, and reinforce those things, which unfortunately is uh, the nature of the society we live in and the access to information we have. Um, I mean, there's the requirement to read Miranda warnings to, uh, to someone who's in custody. And when that is required, uh, some people believe that it's required at the very second that handcuffs are applied, which is not true. Um, but we also have to untrain or retrain. Uh, I apologize, you can't untrain it, but we have to retrain, uh, especially people who have the belief uh, from watching uh, shows like that, that no, this is not when you do it, this is the legal requirement. These are the, the expectations. This is how Miranda is provided and yeah. goes through that. So the level two training is, uh, well, I think it's the uh, financial objectives of getting police officers uh, onto the streets. Uh, it also takes a different approach, which requires the field training officer to tune those issues. And again, we're talking about a standard that probably was set within the last 10 years in my agency and when that was set with the academy uh, for training, uh, I would say probably relatively in that same time frame, but it might have been lesser time. Thank you. But if everybody's if they're, if they're getting training in the field and everybody in the field is doing things different ways, it's not a very good way. To, the training is going to result in a bunch of people doing things all different ways because they're, they're, the people they're learning from don't necessarily have uniform procedures. Yeah. Allison, did you have your hand up? I did, because uh, I'd love to follow up, because Brian's question is my question, and it, Curtis, I mean, basically, and we've heard from other people that actually it, it may be trained, but there isn't uniform policy in how everybody is, is doing things, and it's not just how, and if level two isn't trained, they shouldn't be allowed to stop cars. I mean, if they're not trained with a uniform policy with the public, like, they shouldn't be allowed to enact, interact with the public. I mean, that it, to me, the uniform policies are uniform values with which you administer police, a, a professional police, um, your, 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 your policing duties. So uh, it, it is, it, it's shocking to me that, that, that level two people are, are able to do that if they haven't actually been taught the uniform policy and uniform policies in everything. It strikes, you know, it, is there uniform uh, and who reviews what uniform policies we have and what which ones we don't? So are, are there uniform policies on search and seizure? Are there uniform policies on uh, on, on, on chokeholds? Are there uniform policies on all these things? And if so, who's responsible for changing them? I mean, obviously the legislature isn't going to be involved in every one of those. It strikes me the training council oversees setting uniform policy. Senator Wade has unmuted herself. Well, I, I, I think that, um, that there's uniform policy and then there's individuals. And there are individuals who, regardless of how they're trained, are not going to abide by the, the best practices. And really training around best practices is what's important. And I don't know that there's such a thing as a uniform policy on stops, but there's tra uniform training on it. And then I, I think that that was one of the things that we talked about is that people who are going to go into supervisory positions, there needs to be a higher standard there of the, the characteristics that you're looking for and how you do that. Because as Anthony pointed out, if, if, if you have people train, um, training people in the field on that are doing it in a different, not in a, the proper, in the best practices, then it's, and I can tell you that um, the, I know that Curtis said that the state police always, the way they do it is they always say, hello, my name is so officer so-and-so, and I stopped you because 
Well, I want to tell you that that isn't always the case either, because I got stopped for a very stupid thing. I went through one of those things that says, don't do this, you know, the, the U-turn. And when I would, and he was sitting right there and I turned right in front of him and he just walked up and he kind of grinned and said, do you know why I stopped you? So, and of course I knew why he stopped me, but he, so in that situation, that was okay for him to say that because it was pretty obvious that, so I think that if we get too hung up on, um, we wanna take into account individual situations and we want people to be trained properly and to do them, but we don't wanna make robots out of people. So, you know, I think we, we need to train them in best practices and they need to actually use their training. I actually don't think that individually they should be allowed to practice it as they want. Robert. Yeah, thank you. When we're talking about uniform practices, uh, I talked about earlier, there's policy, there's training, and then there's accountability. I, I'm not one to advise officers to have a robotic response when they stop a car. Circumstances vary, number of occupants in the car, time of day, weather, I mean, all that are variables. However, there are some um, fundamental standard procedures dictated by case law, uh, which I'm not sure have been discussed before the committee um, there's a relatively recent U.S. Supreme Court case came out in 2015 that said once the reason for seizing the vehicle, blue lighting the vehicle, pulling the vehicle over in Senator White's case for making an unlawful U-turn on the interstate, once that situation's cleared, there's to issue the paperwork in connection with that and let the citizen go on his or her, her way. I did hear the sheriff talk about 45 minutes for backup and um, it runs afoul. Some of it, in my view, is our draconian approach to possession of drugs and, and no knock warrants. And, you know, um, so if you want a dog sniff, I don't know how many canines there are in the state. They're never there when you need them. Um, you have to detain somebody for extended periods of time. Uh, Last I knew, an exterior dog sniff doesn't require a warrant. Um, so there are, you know, we, we are somewhat unique, certainly in the geography and practice of our 75 agencies are dramatically different. Um, but I think when you're talking about standardized practices, you have to be familiar with case law. Um, and I know it's a challenge for some departments, but the law to me is clear. Once the reason for the stop is cleared, somebody didn't stop at a stop sign or use a turn signal, you write the citation, unless you uncover something independent and objective evidence of additional criminal activity, write the ticket and be gone. Unfortunately, that's not standard practice in what I see in reviewing these cases. Senator Polino, may I uh, respond to both yours, Senator Clarkson's and Mr. Apple's uh, comments? Yes, for sure. Uh, so to yours and Sarah Clarkson's comments, uh, with regards to level two, I, I think it's incumbent to explain some of the process. Uh, the, uh, it's a three phase process to get uh, the certification. The first phase being the two week academy. And so while uh, we discuss, uh, or a patrol procedures instructor will discuss uh, the standard practice, uh, as we all know, if you see, uh, you see something a hundred times and then you're told something different once, that might not be enough reinforcement, which is why there's the level two or phase two and phase three uh, uh, portions, which are in-service training, continued education, as well as one-on-one -on -one supervision by a trained uh, field training officer who's also certified by the council. The uh, FTO, uh, as they're referred to, uh, they go through uh, regular uh, refresher trainings. Uh, I believe it's every two years they go through that regular refresher training to maintain their certification, talking about subjects such as uh, updated uh, policies and trainings of the council are, are covered. The, uh, the process of that, it's actually a heavily evaluated 
uh, program. Uh, it uses what's called the San Jose training model, uh, where there's uh, very specific standards uh, that are explained to the trainee. There's guidelines. I'd be happy to share those with the committee. And they're evaluated on a daily basis. And the design of the, the field training program is to go from a, an unprepared officer to a prepared officer. And we use what we call a crawl, walk, run uh, method. So crawling is usually where the the new, uh, the new officer, uh, they are just watching. They're observing a veteran officer work. The, uh, the walking stage is where they uh, have seen enough. They're using the radio. Uh, they're gonna screw up on their radio and that's part of learning is making a mistake. The goal is, is that we limit where they can make their mistakes to uh, issues that aren't around, um, around safety. Uh, so saying uh, potato instead of uh, Papa or Paul for the letter on the radio isn't going to isn't going to cause an issue. Whereas a person deploying a weapon, uh, there's a very different uh, scenario there. So um, the the level three, the or I'm sorry, the phase three process of, of field training, we're going to see people make mistakes, just as we're going to see level three officers come out and make mistakes, just as we see level three officers make mistakes inside the the uh, confines of the academy. It's the mistakes that help us learn. Uh, so I can't say that you are, uh, even with a, a standard, um, a model policy that's uniform throughout the state, that you're never going to have an experience like Senator White had, where it's pretty obvious why you got pulled over. Uh, but it's also not best practice for uh, to deviate from those practices, because uh, while I might walk up and say, uh, hey, do you, do you have your pilot's license today for somebody who's going so fast, or where's the fire? Well, there might actually be something else going on where that um, that humorous response is is going to cause other issues. So, uh, to those points, um, I don't I, I can't say that even with a, a law uh, that we're always going to have it. In fact, I know that people are going to break laws because that's the reason we have law enforcement is to say people will break the law and we need to do something with that and why we have a criminal justice system. So, uh, to acknowledge that standards are are there and their best practices, I think the training councils and the best place to set those standards. I believe those standards have been set. I believe that refreshing that training uh, is currently accomplished. And uh, we are going to see over time people progress. That's the purpose of training and continuing education. That's why the continued education for all law enforcement officers is now 30 hours uh, each year. And that continues on a regular basis. Uh, to, uh, to Mr. Apple's uh, comments, I, I wanted to be clear that we're, uh, I'm not conflating uh, waiting for backup on a car stop uh, with an unnecessary or unreasonable uh, detention. The 45 minute conversation is if I'm responding to say uh, a report of a fight or domestic uh, assault, uh, knowing that my, uh, my backup may be 30, 45 minutes away, they're on the way, but I'm going to uh, enter into that in a more cautious uh, way that ensures the protection of my life as well as theirs. Uh, whereas uh, on a car stop, we're effectuating uh, a car stop in like five to 10 minutes without a uh, reasonable cause for uh, a longer detention, such as an impaired driver or uh, a bloody chainsaw in the back seat with a, a black trash bag. So uh, there's certainly different things and that's where we can diverge into um, a far more cumbersome process on a motor vehicle stop that turns into a criminal investigation. I just wanna be clear, uh, we're not detaining people for 45 minutes on a car stop for no reason whatsoever or to even wait for a dog, we don't do that. Robert, so you recognize. Robert, I don't want to debate it with the sheriff, but I, I, I and digress into you know specific events. But I, I have repeatedly viewed videos and read affidavits where an officer says I detect the minor odor of alcohol in one case through a closed window, and the citizen is detained for extensive periods of time until a, you know backup or a dog or a threat of a seizure if you don't consent your vehicle is going to be seized so is that really consent when you consent because your car is going to be impounded and you're going to have to walk home like Mark Zullo you know I appreciate the professionalism ex uh, explained to you here today I, I'm, I'm glad I'm on this conversation because Maybe I just see the outliers, but I see them. 
and you talk to other people who do the work that I do, they're there. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's critical work. I support good law enforcement. Um, there are many good officers, and unfortunately, there are some officers who, do, who should not be doing, not exercising the power that we all entrust them in. And I think until we promote accountability, we've talked about policy and training, but I'm not hearing the third leg of that stool, which is accountability. Sure. Policies and trainings are good, but unless you show people that you mean it and you're able to move people out who don't comply with policy, practice, and the law, we're going to continue to have outliers. <laughs> and, and let me just say, when I've gone through this list, when I was not talking, there's three more things I would recommend to you, which is 11, if you don't follow data collection required policies, prevent people from going to the academy so you don't have uh, agencies getting additional officers. I mean, as you know, the academy is the only way you get full-time or, or part-time certification. So if an agency doesn't comply, there's some leverage. That's what I'm talking about in terms of accountability. Yes, adding the executive director of racial equity to the training council makes sense. The training council has, since its inception, been over, overloaded with criminal justice professionals. And 15 is key. I don't know how I read by it. I spent a lot of my last 40 years trying to get dispatch and police agencies not to respond to mental health crisis with a uniform <laughs> officer who is equipped with various tools of force. So thank you again for your tolerance and letting me. Um, thank you. Commissioner Sherling, are you still with us? Do you wanna make any comments? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where to start. Uh, I agree with the, uh, the vast majority of, uh, of points that have been made um, by everybody who's testified today. Um, Robert and I have talked about this uh, for years. Um, in terms of uh, prioritizing uh, the notes that are here, um, I think these are all areas where we uh, should be working to make progress. Which ones are best in legislative purview? Um, I, I think I again go back to uh, the concept that if the legislature is able to provide us with a directive construct to, to create uniform policy procedure and capacity to do the top whatever, three, five, seven things that you identify um, without being specifically prescriptive on exactly how to do it, um, we are poised to engage uh, the community statewide and come back to you with um, significant progress, I think, before uh, the end of this year um, with many things being fully uh, deployed. Uh, the central reporting point for allegations uh, certainly should not be difficult uh, to stand up. Uh, difficulty, of course, becomes where they go from there. Uh, this committee has started to explore various models on uh, on oversight and accountability, uh, potentially regionally. Um, you know that I think that's an area that's going to take a little bit longer, but it's important not to lose the momentum there. Um, and you know, beyond that, I don't know how much time to take going line by line here through through all of these. Uh, I, I think most of them are addressed in our uh, our draft ten point plan, which, of course, as I've mentioned, and I want to reiterate, requires additional community engagement before it is is fully vetted. Sure. Okay. I want to check in with the committee a little bit um, in terms of timing. I know Brian had talked earlier about needing to move on after a bit. I'm just wondering, give well, me a minute. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Brian. I, I had a caucus scheduled actually with the governor, but I blew it up. Well, I don't say I blew it up. I chose to stay here because I this was more important to me today. And I, I'm certainly uh, grateful that his office understood that. Um, I just, maybe I could ask Senator White a question um, who sits in judiciary and there's a bill there, or at least they're working on similar kinds of legislation um, and get her guidance on how much 
of this are we going to try to put in one of our bills? Is it going to be three items? Is it going to be four? Is it going to be uh, a lot of studies? I'm still trying to get my arms around, you know, the work that we're trying to get accomplished in, a, in, in essence in a week. Oh, and you can't talk to us. Okay. That's okay. Um, so anyway, Anthony, that's where I am. And now you're muted. Am I the only one no, talking I to yourself, you're... Brian? No, no I think I'm fine. No, I, I, I think, Maybe. Brian, you ask a good question, which is uh, I, sort of I'm, I'm unclear on what our charge is here. Uh, and I think there are things we could ask uh, of uh, the department to go forth and work on. We could ask. Uh, you know, we can ask for some very specific things, but I think we need to be sort of clear on what we're honing in on and what our charge is. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 I'm sorry, John Flowers? You're muted. muted. John, you're muted. Okay, hopefully I'm there now. Yeah. Thank you, right. so, thank you so much for this additional opportunity. Uh, you should have received uh, uh, a letter from uh, Senator White from the New England First Amendment Coalition. We just wanted to uh, note our support of that document. Uh, in terms of the points uh, that are laid out, uh, we have a couple. Uh, we would really like it if the uh, officers going through the police academy could be uh, no. To take a minimum of two to three hours of First Amendment and media relations training uh, on such issues as the right of free speech, the right to assemble, free press, right to redress, to revents, that those types of things. And that could even tie into a couple hours on how to address or talk to the public, especially those of color or from an international setting. Uh, we uh, are not crazy about the notion of being able to redact any uh, any of the footage from uh, police body cams. We think that you know what what is laid bare should be laid bare for everyone. Um, and uh, when uh, an officer betrays a public trust. And those allegations are substantiated. We'd like to see those be made public. Um, and I know there have been perhaps occasions where someone has been allowed to resign without the issues coming to the fore. We would prefer that that you know any proven claims be sub that are that are substantiated be be brought into public view. Those are some of the the points we'd like to mention. So about uniformity and, and uh, accountability, it seems. Who did you well, say you were talking on behalf of those, John? I'm sorry, the Vermont Press Association. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. I just wasn't sure. Allison? No, I'm just curious. Um, the training, uh, when you talk, John, about, about the officers uh, also, uh, training, train, I mean, do we, do we make recommendations to the training council or do we uh, charge the training council with uh, uh, creating best practices and uniform policy? I mean, who whose job is it in some ways to, to do all the things that we're asking? The allegations and the accountability, I think clearly we've got to figure out what the best place, before we have an inspector general, what's our best interim step on that? Because that's critically important. Uh, but the rest, you know, we make recommendations, but there is the body that is responsible for constructing the curriculum for training. And so should we be making legislative recommendations or we should be sending a letter, one of our famous GovOps letters to the training council and saying, you know, after much discussion, these are our suggestions for you to, to to, to move on and not, I mean, I'm sort of a, a loss here of where does, in some of these cases, where to direct 
because some people are already responsible for doing some of this stuff. Uh, and the same question comes with decertification. All right, Senator White. So I'm sorry, I was out of commission there for a little while and I might be again, but we do mandate certain training. And the problem is, is that as Chris Bray has pointed out, we have a box of time. And whenever we mandate new training, something has to move out. So I think that what we are looking at is, and one of the uh, lists, one of the things on that list was asking the training council, along with other people to review what it is that's in their training. Right. And, and what needs to be there and what needs to be there for everyone. For example, Mark's, uh, Sheriff Anderson's comment about does he really need search and rescue training? Because he doesn't do search and rescue. So we, we need to have the training council along with others review what it is that there is necessary for them and what can be done in the field and what can be done in continuing education units. So that was one of the recommend one of the things on the list here. But yes, right. we mandate training. We mandated um, domestic violence training. We mandated fair and impartial policing training. We mandated, um, and every time we do, we bump something else out of out of there. Right. No, I I I, I realize. I, oh, I thought you were asking who. Well, no, who I, I. But it, with all the things that we're talking about now, I mean, it, 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 do we begin as broadly as asking the training council to review what they're doing and to take in, into consideration incorporating uh, th these other high priority issues? Well, I think did everybody get the list of? Yes, I think it was sure. Yep. Okay. We've been talking about it. Okay, I, and I apologize. Um, it's okay, we hope you did brilliantly on 124 in a probes. Oh, I didn't, but Betsy did. I would apologize. Never apologize. So, I was hoping that, and I realized that this, uh, these invites went out late today, but we are under some time constraints, and this was going to be our topic for the last week and a half so um if people were surprised by an invite that seemed to be late i apologize um we are um and and senator collimore to your um what what judiciary is doing is um looking at a ban on the on chokehold which we're having a great deal of discussion about because it's already and not an accepted practice. So we're banning something that's already not accepted. Um, we're looking at uh, data collection. And so I think we don't need to look at data collection because that's in, the, in that bill. And then um, the use of force is what they're looking at there and um, training around use of force and what is use of force and um, there's a great deal of discussion about different types of use of force. And um, as Mark likes to point out, the mere presence of a uniform can be considered a force. Um, so need to look at that, but th that's what judiciary is doing. So then it makes some sense for us to focus on Just Wait, uh, 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 Brian had a question. He had his hand I'll, up. I'll yield to Senator Bray because he hasn't had a chance to say much today. I'm not, I'm not raising my hand. I'm, I'm in listening mode. So. Oh, okay. Well, I, I just wanted to point out one of the bills that we did pass today, I don't remember whether it was second or third reading, had to do with the mental health piece that we've been talking mm -hmm. about as well. Right. Right. So I don't mm -hmm. think we need to talk about that right. because I think that's already going to get taken care of. Right. But we we still could we could make recommendations about training. I think that would be appropriate if we you know that it could be integrated into the judiciary bill. I think we well, can take a look at some of the issues that we're concerned about. I mean that well, here was here I think is the the 
the in talking with the uh, with Senator Ash, the way um, anything we come up with will not go into the judiciary bill. It will be an amendment to 124 from our from this committee. So it'll be a floor amendment from this committee to 124. That is the the most reasonable way to do this right now. Um, and I think there are some specific things that we can put in there and then asking for a lot of, you know, Susanna Davis was with us the other day and what she said was, don't make um, final decisions about something that, is about issues that are really complex and need a lot of community input. Right. And it's more important to get to set up the the um, pathway forward for them and let them come back with um, specific recommendations and get it right rather than rush into something. So I think that's what we're thinking about here is there may be some specific things, um, but there may be other uh, other things that we're just setting up. A, a, a pathway and telling people go do this just like we did when we asked them to come up with alternative methods of, of um, moving from level two to level three and alternative methods of the acad of the, the training itself. So I think that's what we're doing mainly. Oops. Anthony. Robert. I have a question for Senator White as membership on judiciary. I've been following from a distance H808, I think it is, which is regarding use of force and whether it should be uh, in accord with US Supreme Court policy that uh, the only thing that's examined on use of deadly force is the last few seconds before an officer deploys deadly force. I see that our AG has come around and is now um, advocating for a, a, a reasonableness standard is that in the judiciary's bill? Is the Senate working on that issue? I think it's a very critical issue in connection with- Well, we're not dealing with the with those bills. It's all in is 219. Which is a Senate bill. Yeah, everything is kind of being put in there. Okay, the reason I raise it, and Digger did a series on this, in the last decade, we've had a plethora of officer-involved fatal shootings. And um, it's awfully hard to put the smoke back in the bottle on that, but in order to uh, prevent further harm, I think it makes sense to heighten personal responsibility when an officer overreacts to a particular set of stimuli. So I, I would bring it to the Senate's attention through speaking of GovOps and judiciary. I just hope it doesn't get lost in the in all the work you're all the good work you're doing so this year. Thank you. Yeah, I. Um, we're talking about a reasonable standard and necessary standard, and it's and it is, it is quite complicated. And, it is. Um, um, and I, I just, and I know we have um, some bad actors out there, but I um, think that for the most part, we we had a long, long, long um, discussion this morning on use of force, and Drew Broom, who's the one of the use of force instructors talked about what what they teach and and how to use it and when to use it and and the, so you, it's hard to um, know how anybody's going to react when they're in a situation where they feel threatened and somebody's coming after them with a knife or whatever it is. So I think we need to um, or continue. Perceive a perceived weapon as we see nationwide and some no no i'm not talking about just a perceived weapon i'm talking about a, a real yeah. weapon and or a perceived weapon i guess but so i i think that um what we need to do is make sure that we continue the kinds of training that we are doing and improve uh that's why it says review the 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 Training Council, along with others, should review what's actually in the training and what. And I think that, I think that um, the commissioner was very clear that that's they're looking at alternative methods of of doing it. How do how do you do it? Do we do some training and then an internship and then training and then? So I think that we need to just ask them to 
look at that. I no, I'll see. I'm so, sorry. Uh, you know, we're asking about what we're going to focus on. I think we really, I, I think it's uh, it's increasing. The rain, the rain we should focus on train on accountability and figure out what how what we want to do around accountability. Uh, and I think we need to focus on training. It's our area. It's it's we're, it's our jurisdiction. How we improve uh, officer training and the racial equity uh, director on the training council. We can do that and anything around uniformity. It sounds like the data collection uniform issues are being dealt with in judiciary, but we have the issue of uniform policies and encouraging uniform best practices being taught. So I don't know where that that may go into the training of uh, uh, and the training council bucket, but I think those are the kind of the three things we could do right now is uh, figure out what we want to do around accountability. We've had some good suggestions, and I think. Uh, we have some interim measures before we create yet another new office, which maybe at this point, you know, even though all of us would like to have an inspector general, I don't think it's about to happen immediately. Uh, but I think, anyway, I think we can do things in those three areas right now. I, could I ask a question, Anthony? Sure, sure. Where did the idea for an inspector general come from? Rob Appel mentioned that when we were talking about the need for an independent place to re report. Right, on, on accountability and our discussion on accountability. The, the regional citizen review boards, the, the human uh, rights commission in between, but really the ideal would be to have an inspector general, but Robert's here and he can tell you himself. But, well, but I, we, just, but we, also, we also followed up by saying, suppose we couldn't have an inspector general, what would be the next best thing given current resources? <laughs> Right. And what is that? Human or, rights. No, I'll, I'll find out later. Human so, Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission was mentioned, although they're not sure they have the resources, but they're to, represent. To do, a, to do what? To be a place where. Um, where, where allegations. Allegations, and, reports of mis possible misconduct could be reported. Hmm. We're not, it's, like, it's not coming up for third reading or anything yet. Don't worry. No. no, no. <laughs> Chris? Chris Bray? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, we all were chatting via email a little bit over the last 24 hours. Uh, and I still have that concern. Uh, Senator White just brought it up again in a way, you know, about... Um, making sure that the right people are included in the conversation at the right time, which I would say is from the outset, you know, that there's that saying, which I'm not gonna be able to quote quite right, which is, you know, nothing, nothing about us without us. And right. I, and I, so I know we're, we're treading this fine line of feeling um, a desire and pressure to respond in a timely way. And then we know what we're talking about is long-term reform with a lot of, uh, subtlety to it. So yeah. I appreciate that we're struggling with that. And I I just want to make sure we don't sort of fall into the trap of going a little too fast and, and getting off on the wrong foot. So. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm running out of gas here pretty fast. Yeah, as I say, it's 20 to 5. Um, I think we could call it a day soon. Yeah. So we have 20 minutes to we're back on the floor for the next three hours. So it's uh, good what? time to get a snack. I mean, it's a joke. It's a joke. Oh, good. Nobody thought it was funny. I missed something. Yeah. <laughs> what we need is another three hours of floor. Uh, right. So we, Eric, I'm sorry, Julio yeah. had his hand up. Julio? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to echo the point of, that's been made in different contexts. I, I was hearing two different things, so on the issue of accountability, like what do we do now? Um, and um, I, I, this is a bit of a repeat of my testimony the other day about different models of oversight, but there are a lot of different ones. Even an inspector general model, there are at least three different types of inspector generals. Um, and you have to decide what sort of complaints get there. Um, 
if someone says, I, you know, I'm innocent, is that an allegation of police misconduct or is that a defense? So, um, and the way that, you know, none of them are perfect, but the more successful models involve a lot of research and looking at what other boards or models do and asking them what works for them and what doesn't. And then working with the community management, labor, uh, everybody who's involved and picking the model or as is, is increasingly common overlapping models where you have an inspector general or an auditor and something else. Um, I, I, so I, I, I had unraised my hand because I just heard someone talking about not about us without us, which was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hearing a fair amount of that. And I understand it's the last few days of the session and I'm, I'm hearing concerns from people who aren't here today, who couldn't be here today, that they're worried that something's gonna be etched in, in legislation and, and cut off those choices, so. Right, um, good point. Yes. Yeah. So when in these notes that I sent out, when it said review the policies and stuff, it didn't mean for us to review them. What it meant was to require a review of all of those policies and all of those guidelines by whether it's whether we ask it be done by the training council along with the human rights commission along with whoever but that's so it wasn't us doing a review and coming up with okay. suggestions it yeah, was I don't meant think there was i don't think there was consensus about how that was read so i'm happy to pass that on thank you right i mean that was my question to you jeanette last night which is who is reviewing it i assume that in the training council would be reviewing the things we asked them to review and the other well, i think yeah i think that um it would be reviewed along with um stakeholders and com and the communities that are affected right I also think it's important what was just said about getting a lot of input. I mean, we've been working on this and we tend to hear from the same voices, people who continue to show up, which is they're the good voices. And I'm glad they're showing up, but there's other people who are clearly not showing up for whatever reason. And we just have to be aware of that. Uh, uh, Julio, uh, who, who would you, how would you conduct a review, an appropriate review on accountability statewide? I mean, wh wh where would you charge, who would you charge with that work? I don't know. I don't think I've talked enough pe to enough people to have a, a view. I mean, sometimes that um, there are different ways it's done. Sometimes there are outside auditors who conduct what's called a gap analysis. So they identify what the existing goals or standards are, and then they measure where practices are and see how big the gaps are and what it would take or what options there are to fill them. Uh, sometimes that's done by community-based task forces or task forces working in parallel. I don't, I, I didn't come here today with, an, with a particular idea in mind because what I've learned from other places is that you have to talk to a lot of people and hear their ideas about what they think works because um, uh, what works in some places are, is a solution that works in an urban area and maybe not uh, places like Vermont. So, right. so I, and, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer off. off right. Off no, I, and I think it's just because I, we, I, and I think we need to talk to a lot more people and a, and a broader range of people as, as was just noted. Right. And, and Robert may have ideas on this too, but I think that's one of our questions is who do we charge with reviewing what the appropriate accountability is for Vermont. Well, we can, we can, I'm sorry. I, I don't have the answer to that one, but I do want to take the opportunity to thank you all for allowing me to participate today. Thank you, Senator White, for sending out the invite. I'm a member of the VSP's uh, FIP committee, and that's how I got it. And I appreciated the opportunity to share my thoughts with you today. And, um, so you could hear and consider them before you act. And yes, I think it's important to get stakeholders, but, but you have to balance that with the need to act, as you all know. So I wish you the best in your work. And if I could be of any further help, you know how to find me. We'll be in touch. Yeah, thank, thank you, Robert. And, and just for your information this morning in judiciary, we heard very distinct um, act now, do something. It's really important. 
it's better to get it um, right. So don't act in haste. So mm -hmm. there isn't, there really isn't a, a, a single voice on oh, sure. what we should do right now and what we should put off and how we should do it. So we just well, have Senator, to use our best judgment. Senator, as you know, that's why they pay you the big bucks. To construct oh, was that why? Oh. Thanks that's for why. reminding us of that. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. I'm ready to adjourn.